If you have your Bibles, we are going to be in Ezekiel chapter 3, and we're going to cover the first 15 verses tonight in a message that we are uh, entitling Declaring the Word of God, Declaring the Word of God, Sharing the Word of God, Speaking the Word of God. How many of you guys believe that it's part of our job to share the Word of God? Yeah, all hands got to go up. We're going to give you a little verses to back that up because it's so true. Uh, when the Lord saves you, when the Lord brings you on board, uh, all we could do is honor him and bless him. And what he would like for you to do more is tell someone about Jesus. Tell someone your experience, how the Lord reached out to you and your family and saved you. So it's a good thing. So let's open up in prayer and then we'll go ahead and, and start our study tonight. It'll be a quick night tonight. We should be out of here by 8 o'clock prayerfully and could get back home. And at 8 o'clock tonight, if you don't know this, uh, Jack Hibbs and uh, a couple of fellows are sharing uh, tonight on YouTube and they have some great things to bring up, a prophecy update tonight. So if you get home, you want to go ahead and tune in and catch some of that good stuff that's going on out there broadcasting from Southern California on YouTube. Father God, we want to lift up, Lord, those in Florida right now, Lord, those who are going through a tough time and some of them are panicking, Lord. There's many that are alone and uh, they just don't know what to do, Lord. Water has surged high. And so a lot of things are going on, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the drainage system, for the responding teams that will be helping out as soon as uh, it's safe for them, Lord. Uh, we're glad, Lord, for hospitals and doctors and just uh, so many volunteers that help out. But Lord, be with the people, Lord, as they cry out your name tonight, Lord, and draw some to you, Lord. May some come because some share and declare the good news with them, Lord, the news of hope. Father, we lift up our our church family right now up at the, the high school, Lord, as they're having this uh, build of faith, Lord, uh, going on. And uh, they're sharing their faith, Lord, out there. So we pray that you would be with them as well. For us, Lord, we ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would be our teacher once again as we open up your word. Consider the work that you gave Ezekiel to do, Lord. So with that, Lord, we invite you to fill our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Certainly want to welcome you guys who are listening on radio. Those of you guys who are Watching on YouTube, want to give you a little shout out as well. All right. So as God called the Old Testament prophets and leaders of the past, today, with all the knowledge that we have, we have the word of God. We have his spirit that indwells us. We are better off than prophets from the past as far as knowing about the Lord, knowing what his message is for mankind seeing uh, and, and being part of his grace reaching out to us. God in the, in the Old Testament would send the prophet to talk to his people. And his people would be, oh man, it didn't have to be this way. It's always this way. But here, here comes, and so God punishes those people. But here comes a prophet. God sends someone to share with them, to remind them to get back. For us today, we know this. We know the heart of God. We know that he desires that nobody perish. There's room in heaven, big, big house, big, big table, lots of food. As that old song used to say, God desires that no one loses out. And so he sends pastors. He sends great songs on the radio. He sends great preachers everywhere so that there's an invitation that goes out. But really what's important is he wants to send each and every one as representatives of him, as inviters to the people who are invited. He says, listen, there's, everything is prepared. Heaven is prepared, but there's somebody else that, that can come. And so don't you ever say, well, I can't share the gospel because I heard that it was full in heaven. There's no, just no more room. No, that's not it at all. Heaven is an open place, an inviting place, and God's looking back and he says, you know, I have blessed you, and I have blessed you and you and you, and would you guys just share about me with someone that doesn't have any hope? That with someone that thinks that everything is done, would you just share with them a little bit, right? And who knows what they're going through? You don't know what they're going through, but as the Lord speaks to your heart, take it as a go, 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 right? Share with, uh, with them about the Lord. Declare the word of the Lord. When I say that, I mean sometimes you... I don't know what to share. Well, share a little verse with them. You know, share something that you remember that the Bible has said. Something that's spoken to your heart. We know that God is love. Some people feel like they're not love, 
right? There's some people that feel that they're all alone and because they failed in life, that's what the world would call failures in life. Uh, you have the opportunity to share about a loving God who cares for them and they can always start over with the Lord. They can start over with the Lord as he invites people to come in. So we ourselves, then we are to consider ourselves like also watchmen. What's a watchman? If you're looking for work sometimes, you're looking through the want ads, and they sometimes have watchmen needed for a Pepsi warehouse or watchmen needed at the airport or watchmen needed for Walmart. So, and so what's the job of a watchman? A watchman is just alert. If there's a weird truck coming into the company and you don't recognize that truck, you'll call your boss. Hey, boss, I just wanted to let you know I saw a truck come in. And so the boss says, all right, yes, we were expecting that truck. Or he'll say, huh, delivery was over six hours ago. What is that truck doing here? And so you did your job by alerting them, right? And so Ezekiel, we find out, also fills in the job of a watchman. And so do you. Let me tell you how you do it. You know that the Lord is coming soon. You should know that. You know that there's a rapture that's going to take place, and it is a surprise to people who weren't expecting it. It's like a thief coming at night. If you knew he was coming, you'd be ready. But a thief comes, and it's basically a surprise for all people who weren't expecting him. It should never be a surprise for you and I who know the Lord is coming to take his people. So in that sense, we are watchmen. We are to be sharing with people that you need to be ready. You need to be ready to go with the Lord at any time. And so Ezekiel fills that role as well, but it's something for us as well. And so as we're declaring the word of the Lord, we're to, we should be saying it with the urgency in our hearts. Hey, listen, tomorrow might be too late. I'm sharing with you today. It's kind of like Sean and I were talking about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is going to come up, and it's a time for family. And it's a time for family as they're finished up the meal and you see someone's eyes looking and there's still one more leg of the turkey, it's time. It's time for you to help yourself to that other drumstick that's right there. Tomorrow might be too late. Or Fido might come in and snag a piece. Or someone feeling generous might take the piece and feed Fido. You never know, right? Uh, if you're around my house and my son Ben Jr. is uh, staying over, uh, he loves leftovers. So he'll be in it at 2 o'clock in the morning before everybody gets up just helping himself to another drumstick. So, in other words, we're having dinner, everything's there, it's time to take advantage of it because you don't know what's going to come after it. It's the same thing as Christians. As Christians, we know the Lord is coming for us, and therefore, when we share, when we declare his word with people, we say it with the, there's an urgency for you to respond. There's an urgency for you to uh, get on board with the things of God. And, and guys, I'll tell you, uh, like Sunday, we had a couple people come up, right, and, and you, on second service. So it, these things happen, so you never know when someone's going to say, uh, what must I do to be saved? Could you imagine someone asking you that question? What must I do to be saved? And we say to them, the Word of God says, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Believe, right? It doesn't tell you you got to do 100 spiritual jumping jacks, 50 Holy Spirit push-ups. It doesn't say anything like that. It says, believe in your heart. He came to earth. He died for us on a cross. They buried him. Three days later, he arose. And he told us he's coming back for us. Right? He forgives us of our sins. He helps us start over in life. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's how we start. We declare his word. So if the prophets of old had a responsibility before the Lord and his people... Uh, we have the same responsibility today to share the word. So let's consider as we read from Ezekiel chapter 3, God's heart reaching out to a stubborn, hard-hearted people as he desires for them to change their life, change their hearts. Their hearts have been way far away from God, and God wants them to change his heart. Why? Listen, listen, even believers, if believers slip and fall, and let's just say they go back to their drug days, or they go back to their uh, driving fast without paying attention to stop sign days, or uh, whatever. If you do not repent from that, even as a believer, and the Lord's saying to repent, dude, do that, you will die. 
You, it's just a matter of time for an accident to happen. And so what's the Lord doing? The Lord is talking via or speaking to his people via Ezekiel. Look, you, do you want to die early? Do you really want to die early? You want, you want to leave early before your time? If not, repent. Repent. Because Christians that don't repent fall into things that lead to death. You know, these, some of these sins are even up to death, the Bible says. And that's what he's talking about. Because they don't respond. They don't correct their ways. They don't, um, as we would say, get with the program with the things of God. All right? So let's begin with the, uh, the responsibility of this prophet. So the Lord's going to speak to him. So look at verse 1. More, moreover, he, it's capitalized, so it's God said to me, Ezekiel's writing this down, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. Verse 2. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat the scroll. Verse 3. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with the scroll that I give you. So I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. Let's just pause here for a second. Number one, we have learned that Ezekiel was a priest. That's his first training that he grew up. His dad was a priest. He's going to be a priest, kind of like your dad's a carpenter, and you're going to grow up to be a carpenter type of guy. So Ezekiel was a priest, but the Lord called him to step into the office of a prophet, someone that would speak for the Lord. So uh, it's like us today. He knew that God's word, because he was a priest, he knew that God's word is pictured as food to eat. You and I know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. So we get it. We understand that eating, when it says eat the word, eat the scroll, eat his word, we understand that we want to take it into ourselves. We nourish ourselves with the word of God. And when it's inside of us, we get to experience how the Lord really feels about things. How the Lord cared for people. Ezekiel's kind of type of guy that probably says, you know what? These guys messed up. They deserve what they're getting. And there's a lot of Christians that say, these guys messed up. They're all jacked up and they deserved it. Right? But when you take of the word of God that God is merciful, compassionate. Oh, do I have to chew on it? Chew on it. Did not God have mercy on you? Yes, he did. did he, has he not been compassionate towards you? Yes, he has. Did he not save you and forgive your sins? And then we go, mm. yeah, he did. So it's in us. That's what it means to eat the word of God, to get the flavor that he has towards the people so that we can respond with a heart now as we share with people. We're now going to speak with them with compassion, with the same kind of love and mercy that God shared with us. That's what happens when we eat the word of God. So he says to him to go ahead and eat this, and he did it. So he does it. Let me put this up. Eating the word of God. Job, the, the old guy, one of the oldest guys around, Job valued God's word more than his necessary food. So we see that in Job 23, 12. You hear some people, you know what? I don't need something to eat right now. I'm just going to be in the word of God, and I'm going to fast one, two, three, or whatever many days because you want to spend time with the Lord. Moses, he admonished the Jews to live on God's word. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. He told them, man, guys, you want the heart of the Lord? you got to eat his word. you got to know what he's talking about. The prophet Jeremiah ate the word of God, Right? We saw that in Jeremiah chapter 15, the, the couple books before this one, uh, verse 16. And then the apostle John, recently we read that he also ate the word of God. A scroll, if you may, Revelation 10, verse 8 through 10. So are they really eating paper? paper? No, they're not eating paper, but they're taking it in. Sometimes if, if you're doing an exercise or you're, man, I got to do this action sermon so that people get it. Then they'll take a piece of the, you got to eat your word. <laughs> and start eating. And people are looking at you, dude, you're weird. And you are weird. Because it doesn't mean that it says to take it in as if you were nourishing yourself with the food of what God has to say. That's what that means. Uh, so, again, eating the word of God, there's an application for us. God's prophets, right, yesterday's and today, right, must speak from within their hearts or their message will not be authentic. In other words, if you don't have 
the heart that the Lord has, if you haven't been chewing on it and thinking about it for yourself, how God has been merciful to you, how are you going to speak with any authenticity? How are you going to say, listen, I know God could save you because he saved me. I know God could give you a job because he gave me a job. I, maybe you've been destroyed, your spouse walked out on you and this and that, but I know that it's not the end of the world because God had something for me after it was all said and done. You might say, well, you, don't, you haven't been through what I have been through, and I can tell you, probably not, nor do I want to. But I can tell you the God who helped me is available to help you. How do we know that? Because we know what he's done for us and we've taken in his word. And that's how we speak with some authenticity when we have eaten the word of God. So this is what God has called Ezekiel. This is part of his responsibility as a prophet. You must eat the word of God. You must know how I feel about that situation so that you can speak to the people with, with your, your whole heart. Thus, church, we ended chapter 2, actually. Look at verse 9. Uh, in verse 9, Ezekiel mentioned, now, at, towards the end, now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. So here's that scroll that we're saying to eat the word of God. That's why it's come up, right? So in verse 9 of chapter 2, it said that, and then 10 says, Then he spread it before me, right? And there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. In other words, the sins of the people had been so bad. And I shared with you, when you want to tell someone something, you write a little note. Hey, man, call me because there's an opening at Walmart for blah, 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 blah. And you hand them a note. But if there's three openings, oh, man, so there's one in Walmart. Also, little arrow, turnover. There's one at, and you put it in everything. you got plenty to write. Well, for Ezekiel, when God shows him the scroll, it's written in the front and in the back. But its contents are that there was woes, that there was some bad stuff that the guys had done, the people had done, so God was going to deal with them, and he does begin to deal with them in chapter 4 onward, and we'll see them as we look at that, right? All right, so here's the deal. It is a great honor to be a spokesman for the Lord, but we must be able to handle both the bitter and the sweet. The sweet things are God's promises, and you see them come about, and you share with people. Didn't I not tell you? Yeah, oh, man, I've been born again. My sins are forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. But the other part is, for those that will not repent, it's not going to go well with you. And you need to know the truth. Turn your back on the Lord, and it's not like he turned his back on you. You walked away. We used to say, uh, when I first came out, it was the first time I ever seen pump things out on ranches and things, and water actually comes out. They call it a, a, a spout or a spigot that has water. And, of course, you don't have that in the cities. But if, there's a, if you can imagine a big old giant, uh, uh, one of those things, water things, if you, and the Lord's pouring his blessings and stuff, it's water coming on you, it's cause, and you're walking with him and you're obedient to him. It's always a blessing. It's always a cool shower. It's always something good. But if you walk away, I don't want nothing to do with that. I don't want nothing to do with you, God. It's not like God turned his back on you. You walked away from the spout of blessing. And though he calls you, come back. You know, how to, you know I'm here. Come back to my ways. So your ways will be refreshing when we don't do it. We die out there in the wilderness. It's not like he killed you out there. No. He, you know, once you leave the Lord, Satan's after you like a lion. And he'll make situations seem so appealing, so bright, so shiny. You go after them only to find yourself dealing with fool's gold or, or something horrible. Right? So we don't leave his blessing. That's what happens to us. So bitter and sweet. You must share the truth. It's going to be sweet. It's not like your problems, there's not consequences for them, but God will see you through them. But if you don't, I want to tell you something, and this hurts me more to tell you the truth, but the truth is keep walking away from the Lord, and it's not going to go well for you. Keep walking away from the Lord, and you're going to lose your blessings. We are to hang in there, especially in these last days. We're to hang in there and be an encouragement to one another in the things of God. So, church, again, we are to consider ourselves as Christians, those who are watchmen, those who declare the word of the Lord to others. That's our job. That's a primary call. And that should be something natural in us to want to share with others good news, not keep it to ourselves. Verse 4, look at your Bible. Then he said to me, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. Ooh, my words? 
I don't want to hear your words. You're going to speak my words. When you're speaking for the Lord, you speak his words, not, well, I believe it's like this, or I think it's, no, you speak my words when you have a message to say, right? Five, for you are not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language, whose words you cannot understand. Surely, had I sent you to them, they would have listened to you. But the house of Israel will not listen to you, because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. So God's saying, listen, I'm sending you to a people, but they're going to ignore you. But you're still the watchman. Again, you're working for Walmart, strange truck pulls up. You can't say, well, it looks like the truck that pulls up every once in a while. Maybe the guys are just going to camp. No, you're not doing your job. Your job is to, ah, here's that truck again. Ding, ding, ding. Boss, that goofy truck is here again. Right? So part of your watchman duty is that. And then to declare the word of God is that we need to share with people, even if it's the same people, even if they didn't hear you last week. How many of you guys have shared with someone twice? Ten times. Yeah. We've shared with people ten times or over. That's our calling to declare the word of the Lord. Every time the Lord gives us an opportunity and the spirit of the Lord is just bugging you, you ought to share something. Stop it, Holy Spirit. I will if it comes up. Yes, you ought to share something. I will. Calm down. Right? And then all of a sudden they say, hey, are you still going to church? He's telling you, I told you. Right? Follow the lead of the Lord. It is a divine appointment for that person and for you to declare the word of the Lord. That's God giving you an opportunity. Don't let them go by. Too many of us let them go by, but the Lord would want you to uh, take advantage of that opportunity to share with someone his word. All right. He says there's, there, uh, this word impudent means really they, these guys have a hard head. The Bible, the interpretation will tell you, strong um, forehead. And what it means also is that these people are not going to show due respect to you as, as God's messenger. They're not going to show you respect. Get out of here, preacher. Get out of here, Mr. Prophet. You know, go do something else, you know, whatever. They're not going to show you respect. And so God was preparing Ezekiel to know the people. And Ezekiel knew them, Right? So listen to what verse 8 says. Behold, I have made your face strong against their faces <laughs> and your forehead strong against their foreheads. Like Adam and stone, harder than flint, I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. So let's, let's take this from verse 3 first. From verse 3, as soon as God says, go, Ezekiel becomes a messenger. God said, Go. What did Jesus say to us? If you can remember, last chapter of Matthew, right, 28, what did he say to us in that great, that little part that we call the Great Commission? Exactly. He said, go therefore and make disciples. That's, a, that's a, the Lord putting us to work. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, not just your homeboys, not just your guys from Colorado, Right? Go make disciples of all nations and then baptize them. Baptize them, right? Teach them. And I will be with you always. That's Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. God, as soon as he says to Ezekiel, go, Ezekiel becomes a messenger. For you and I who are Christians today, the Lord says to us, go and make disciples, right? Baptize them, teach them. I'm going to be with you always. But this is what our calling is. Ah, so what is that? How does that work out? Well, first, let's just say you did declare the word of the Lord. And someone said, you know what? Thank you. Would you pray with me? And you pray with them right there and there. You pray with them. And so then next week he says, hey, uh, just wondering if you have time to, to teach me a little bit more. That's what he says. You begin to make disciples. Take some time and do a little discipleship class with them. Share with them. Read the word of God with them. Read the word of God to them. And then share 
from your heart and from your understanding what it means. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. There's four Gospels, four ways to present, and that's just the Lord telling you, see, there's more than one way, right? You can be one of those people that just shares simply the word of God with people. And that's what he sees, go make disciples. And then let's just say, like, uh, give you an example. Uh, so there's this guy named Philip. He's doing some great work for the Lord. And I'll mention him a little bit later. Um, and he's uh, just doing a great work for the Lord. But the Lord calls him and says, hey, dude, uh, there's this guy out there. I'd like you to go over there and talk to him. But, Lord, I'm doing a great ministry here. It's called Calvary Chapel, and we feed the poor, and we do this and that. And, and we, we go through the word. Yeah, good for you, Philip. But get out there and leave your Calvary Chapel for a second and go over there to this guy. So we find that Philip all of a sudden finds himself in the desert with this Ethiopian guy who happened to be like a big shot for Candace the queen. And so as he uh, don't know why you're going there, but it has to be something to do God, God because it's God calling you. So he gets out there, right? And he sees the guy reading. He's up on a chariot and he's reading. And what is he reading? The book of Isaiah. And Philip looks at him and says, dude, do you understand what you're reading? And he goes, how can I, if I don't have someone to kind of explain this to me? I, now, I don't know. Is he talking about someone who's coming, who's going, whatever? Philip begins to share with him what he already knows, just like you share what you know. Don't ever worry about what you don't know. You share what you do know. What brought you up here? Who's taking care of you to today? Who's there for you? You always share what you know, not necessarily be all stomped out or, or st oh, I forget the word, stumped in that I, I, I can't share what I don't know. Don't, God doesn't want you to worry about that. You'll get it eventually, right? That's why you come to church. We, we read and we study together. But share what you do know. So Philip begins to share with this guy, right? And so what if you're sharing with the guy and you're doing his discipleship and like what happens with Philip and this Ethiopian? So do you believe? And the Ethiopian guy goes, yeah, I believe. Thank you. And by the way, he tells Philip, there's some water right here. It's like a little stream, like a little lake. You know, what, he tells Philip, would prevent me from being baptized? What are you going to say? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, let me call Pastor Ben. Come on, man. None of us are greater than each other. At this foot of the cross, down here at the bottom, we were all sinners saved by grace. You want to be great in God's kingdom? Learn to be a servant of all. You want fame and whatnot, or I don't know if you want that or not, but the point is it doesn't make sense to the world that for us to go up on this world, we go down, we humble ourselves. We are no special than anybody else. We're all brothers and sisters that have been saved by grace. So, Philip says to the Ethiopian, nothing, nothing, nothing will keep you from being baptized if that's what you want to do. Let's go for it. So, he comes out of the chariot, and Philip walks with him in the water. They're in the water, right? And he baptizes the Ethiopian guy, right? He comes up out of the water. There is rejoicing going on. The guy is happy, and he's saying, Dude, dude, are you down there? You know, Philip was gone. Philip was gone, right? How many of you guys know the rest of that account? All right, I'll tell it to you again. Just a few of them. God raptured him out of there, and he takes him to the city, another city, Azotas, right? And he's there again doing what he was doing before. But God took that time out. To use him in discipling someone, in sharing with someone, in baptizing someone, right? And then he's back to his regular life. God wants to use you and I to declare the word of God. And then Jesus says, and then go and make them disciples. Baptize them. Teach them. And I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. Which will be the rapture for us or till we die. The Lord is going to be with us. So we are to be these, huh, I heard it, I, I read it, and what's left? I need to practice what I believe in. I need to be this person that the Lord was talking about. I need to be this 
Ezekiel that God is teaching him and training him. And then we look back, and that's why I say we know more than the prophets. We know more than the disciples because we, get, we have the whole counsel of God. We get it. His spirit is in us. And so our brain understands it. We can wrap our arms around things that the world just looks at us and says, you guys are not so. But we say not so, right? Because we understand. We get what the Lord is doing. It's an amazing thing. All right. So for Ezekiel, three things are involved here, right? Three elements are involved. Number one, speaking. You have to speak. You have to share. This is what, what the Lord is calling him to do. Secondly, uh, receiving. Receiving is understanding the message you're going to give. If you don't know what 2 plus 2 is, if you don't have the answer for, how are you going to tell your kids with confidence? Right? It's that simple. You knew, and, and for me, to understand fractions, I, I was the kind of guy that the teacher had to put four apples Right there on the table in front of us, and we were learning in school, third grade or second grade, I forget where it was at. And when he took one away, he says, this is Ben, one-fourth of the apple, or one-fourth of the, the group of apples, right? Or he sliced it, and he gave me one-fourth, and he ate the, the other piece. But I got it. The lights turned on. Some of us, we act like, you, have, you, you know the answer? Oh, yeah, we know the answer, yeah. Next day is the test, and we have a pencil, and we don't know what answer to answer, right? Because we lied. We said we understood, but we didn't understand. But when the Lord puts it to us so simple, we start to get it. So for Ezekiel, you're going to be a messenger of the Lord. You're going to represent the Lord. Three things are involved. Speaking. Got to share with them. You just got to share with them. Got to, oh, I get so nervous. Oh, well, stop thinking about you. It's not about you anymore. Well, you don't understand. I get real shy. It's not about you. Stop being shy. You want to share? You're going to start to share. You're going to have to speak. Secondly, understand the message that you're going to share. Two plus two equals four. And thirdly, obeying. The Lord has asked you to share with the Smith family over here. You're going to share. You need to be obedient. If the Lord has asked you to, spare, to share with a, a special friend that you love dearly, but you know they're lost, dude, you have to be obedient, and you need to share with them. So God's people are important to him. And he tells Ezekiel, I want you to share with them. And so he has to be obedient to share with them. From verse 4, again, we have God's commission. Ezekiel was the messenger. The people of God was then the audience. And the word of God was the message to be delivered. Exactly what God had said to him. That's the message to be delivered. So church, check this out. Ezekiel was not allowed to send an assistant pastor. He wasn't allowed to send someone else to represent him. This was his job. He was not allowed to change the message. If someone says, well, then can all roads lead to heaven? Uh, you can't change the message. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. You cannot change the message. Ezekiel was not allowed to change the message. And for us today, we cannot change the message. Well, how come you guys are so narrow-minded? Well, if you have a problem, you have the problem with the Lord. You don't have it with me. I'm here declaring the word of the Lord to you. That's what I'm doing. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through the Son. There's not ten ways, right? So, yeah, he was not allowed to change the message, nor... Was he allowed to go to a different audience? Did you pick that up? He was not to go. Uh, he, he was not to go to another different people. He was to go to his own people that were captive, and they were already in Babylon, right? So he was to go and speak, and speak means preach. He was to go share with them. From verse five to seven, we have the second element, that of receiving. Again, to receive the word of God is to understand it, to take it to heart, and to take it to mind, right? I receive what God has to say. I believe that the Lord wants to save others as he saved me. And now I understand that in my mind, that's how I'm supposed to go out, right? My church, God sent Ezekiel. Therefore, the people, because they're Jews, they were obligated. 
They had made contracts with the Lord. Do you remember at Mount Sinai? Oh, God, we don't want to. I, I mean, oh, Moses, we don't want to talk to God personally. Would you talk to him? And everything he says, we will do. Right? So there was contracts. They called them covenants. There were agreements. Right? So they were obligated to receive God's message. He was speaking also their own language. <laughs> so there's, their excuses didn't fly. They couldn't say, dude, we don't understand what you're saying. No, you understand what I'm saying because I'm speaking your language. Now, had God sent Ezekiel to another nation, right, and spoke to him through an interpreter, as, uh, as the late Billy Graham used to speak at other nations, and he would use interpreters and they would interpret for him. Uh, the people, this message that Ezekiel was giving, the people from a foreign nation would have understood through the interpreter, what God was doing. But his own people turned a deaf ear to him. You remember Jesus condemning cities? Jesus condemned the Jewish cities for rejecting him. In Matthew 11, verse 21 through 24, he says, quote, Woe to you, Chorazin. The name of the city, not Chorizo, but Chorazin. He says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Right? Woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe to you. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in uh, sackcloth and ashes. End quote. Jesus condemned these Jewish cities because they made themselves deaf. They did not believe what he was teaching them. So the bottom line, church. They, Ezekiel's people, refused to receive the message from God. It's sad today when people we too share with or we, uh, we will share with in the future uh, also reject and won't receive the message of God. It is sad for them. But you again, you know, God's called you. Go out, make disciples. Go out and sh- declare the word of God. He's called us to do this. If they don't, it's on them, not on us. The third element of Ezekiel is obeying. Church, God doesn't send uh, his messengers to people to entertain them or to give them good financial advice. God doesn't send his people to do that. He never sends his people just to entertain them. God expects us to obey what he commands. He expects it. He expects his people back then to obey what the prophet Ezekiel was going to share with them. Unfortunately, the nation of Israel had a bad history when it came to being obedient to the laws of God, to the word of God. They wandered 40 years in the wilderness. All kinds of things have gone bad for them because they did not obey the word of God. So today, when we think about it, times haven't changed much. Like the people of Israel, many people today hear God's word, but they won't try. They just won't try to understand. Okay, I read it, but I didn't understand it, so I'm just going to move on. Really? You're moving on without trying to understand the Word of God? Not a good thing. Or if they do understand it, I get what he's saying. They refuse to do it. Not a good thing. That's the people back then and many people today. Now, again, I like in particular verse 8 and 9, for, for in then God promised to give Ezekiel all he needed. Um, Uh, to more than just hang in there with the people that opposed him. God knew that the people would harden their hearts and faces. Thus, God would harden Ezekiel in a way that would keep him uh, faithful to his mission. Remember, Ezekiel's name, and there's a little play on words here. Ezekiel's name means God's strengthens. God will strengthen. So, you're sharing the gospel with someone, and they look at you... (laughs) You know, something like that. God did the same thing to Ezekiel. He, God made him hard, and he, what you looking at? Oh, you don't get it? You don't understand God's word? And he was in their face. He was sharing in love and compassion, but the, the thing to understand is he wasn't melted. Oh, he looked at me so bad. Oh, he didn't look at me kindly. Oh, what am I going to do? Too many of us, because we have soft skin or whatever, or our personality is we're non-combative, or, and that's a good thing. You don't want to be that. You want to be like Jesus called us to be. But when the truth is a truth, 
You cannot deny the truth. When someone says, well, you tell me that Jesus is the only way, I don't think you're right. You have to come back with something. Such as, well, it's, you're not disagreeing with me. It's not me who's saying to you. You're disagreeing with the word of God. If Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, you know, then he is the way and truth and the life. Well, I don't really agree with you. You don't want to say, then go to hell. You're not going to say that, right? You're going to just say, listen, uh, again, the Lord is speaking to your heart. You're choosing not to be obedient to him. That's you. Or you're choosing to make a big argument and bring all these other things. Well, there's people in Mars and there's people in this. and uh, you know, that's, that You're going somewhere where you don't have to go. You're skating on the outside of the rink when you need to be on the inside in the center. And this is what the word, the word of the Lord is. This is what I mean that the Lord hardened Ezekiel to be able to give an answer back. Ezekiel's name, God strengthens, right? So that's what it meant. All right. So we hear that to receive this from the Lord. How do I apply that? God will strengthen us. Yes, even make us a little harder because he used the word if the need arises to accomplish what he called us to do. We're out of strength. I got I to gotta just pull this rope a little bit more and I'll be over the top and I'll make it. I'm too weak. God will strengthen you. Okay, one more, one more, one more. And get you over. This is what he's talking about. God strengthens us to do what he's called us to do. And you just have to trust him and believe that by faith. And give it all you have. Praise the Lord. Verse 10. Look at your Bible. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, receive into your heart all my words that I speak to you and hear with your ears. Church again. Ezekiel himself has to receive in his heart God's word. And he has to listen and he has to understand. If not, and true for us, we will not speak with conviction. If we have not received the word of God in our own heart, it's impossible then to share with others with any kind of conviction. You're not going to share it, right? How can we tell people that Jesus loves them and gave his life for them if we don't know this personally? If we don't know this personally, what God has done for you, then how are you going to go and tell someone else? There's graduates coming out of seminary uh, today, out of the big ones too, that don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you wonder why pastors leave the pulpit average three years or less across America. They're not speaking with conviction. And, and they, oh, my church doesn't grow. The people don't get saved. Well, are you saved? Well, don't ask me that. I grew up in a Christian home. It's kind of like I'm an American, you know. No, you have to receive him. It has to be a, a, a genuine thing that happened to you, a conversion in your heart. You don't longer think the way you used to think. You used to fall asleep in the Word of God. Some people use sleepies, and others use the first chapter of Exodus or something like that. Right? You're falling asleep all the time. Help yourself to stay awake. You know, and, and now when you receive, if you don't know the Lord, the book is dead. But once you know the Lord, oh, my gosh, this book comes alive. He did what? He parted the waters? He really did that. And you go back and you check the accounts and it's everywhere. Pictures all across the United States of what happened. There was a flood? Absolutely so. All kinds of evidence everywhere you go, right? So, yeah, you experientiated. Now you can speak with conviction. And so, yeah, if we do not understand this perfectly, we must receive it into our heart first before we speak with our mouths. And then, you know, we'll speak when we understand it. Once I understood fractions, dude, I was good. I'll take a fourth of your paycheck. If you, no, just kidding. But you get it. You start understanding, right? And, and you can speak with conviction because you get it. Verse 11, look at your Bible. And go. Get to the captives. Imagine God having this meeting with Ezekiel and go. Get to the captives, to the children of your people. Again, he knows them. He's Jewish, right? And speak to them and tell them, thus says the Lord God. Whether they hear or whether they refuse, then the Spirit, check this out, lifted me up. <coughs> and I heard behind me a great thunderous voice. 
Blessed is the glory of the Lord from his place. 13. I also heard the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touch one another. And the noise of the wheels besides them. And a great thunderous noise. 14. So the spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit or anger. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Then I came to the captives at Tel Abib, who dwell by the river Shabar. And I sat where they sat and remained there, astonished among them seven days. All right, church. This is a great verse, verses, because it speaks of a rapture experience in the Old Testament, right? We know that we're going to be raptured. We're waiting for the, the Lord to come and take us all in a group. But in the Old Testament, the Lord does onesies, you know, and he does it several times. So here we're, we're, is one of those onesies. From verse 11, first of all, God says to go where the captives are. Right? He wasn't there yet. From verse 12 and 14, it is God, the Spirit, that lives and takes as in a rapture. He takes Ezekiel physically, though some theologians might say, well, he was taken in a spirit or a vision. But some of us would say, no, that's not it. Because he sits among the people for seven days in verse 15. So we know it's not uh, in a vision. He takes him there. Thus, church, Ezekiel is raptured, right? Uh, he knew, Ezekiel did, that the prophet Elijah had been taken away. Remember the chariots come down, chariots of fire, and they pick him up, and he's gone. And he leaves his mantle to his uh, next guy, Elijah, right? So he knew this, right? Enoch had been taken by God. Again, there's two onesies, right? And I just shared with you Philip in the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 39, where both he and the Ethiopian unit come up out of the water and the spirit of the Lord when he comes down caught Philip away that's what the Bible says he caught him the same thing uh, being caught up right uh, so that the eunuch saw him no more and Philip was found in the city of Azotus so yes Ezekiel was raptured as one of God's methods of transportation if you may he takes him to where the people were so from verse 12 going back there we have Ezekiel hearing behind him. So here's something that he hears. Blessed is the glory of the Lord from his place. And it was a thunderous voice. So he's hearing this behind him, right? He's hearing it. So church, who is saying this? Or is this just a description? It could be the Holy Spirit saying it as he's transporting Ezekiel. It could be angels since Ezekiel is experiencing something very heavenly, as we would say. We're not sure. Other than Ezekiel is hearing this alone, along. He's hearing this along with verse 13, the noise of the wings of the living creatures touching each other and the wheels beside them, all from his ver first vision in chapter 1. That's how we go chapter 1, chapter 2, we're in chapter 3, right? We took chapter 1, and that was the vision that he had as the Lord is calling him in his glory because he's calling him to a, a heavy-duty task to do. So God shows his glory. So once you see the glory of the Lord, I don't care what, the, what you think. I'm going to do what God called me to do. So these wings, you know, these wheels and stuff, they're in chapter 1. And if, if you need to go back, we have that tape for you so you could catch up. From verse 14, again, Ezekiel went via rapture. But check this out. He was not happy about it. Did you pick that up? He was bitter and he was angry. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon him. Well, what does this mean? What does this mean? Church, this makes me think. Will some of us be angry when the rapture of the church happens? Will some of us be angry? Observe with me from this verse from Ezekiel that it can happen. If Ezekiel God, he's one guy, maybe it can happen to some of us. We become angry. Perhaps some of you would have, let's just put this scenario out there. Maybe you finally get there. And it's time for you to cash your IRA. So you call your investment firm and say, yes, Mr. Smith, you have $500,000. And it's all yours, and we're sending you a check. If that's what you want, yes, that's what I want. Yeah, I'm retired. My wife's retired. We're going to go travel. You know, 
And so you get the check. And, and you're going to the bank, and the bank says, absolutely, we have put that in, and now it's a week later, or however it takes for them to cash your check. How much do you want, Mr. Smith? And you're right about to say, I don't know, I'm going to buy me a little RV, spend maybe $100,000, give me a couple of credit cards with a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of gas, and it's right about, you're right about to get there, and poof, you're gone in the rapture. Would you be angry? Oh, hopefully not. Hopefully, you'd rather leave this world behind, as we have always said, and go forward. But Ezekiel was angry, and it took a strong hand of the Lord to change his heart. What if that you're that young person? You just came up to the altar. Pastor pronounces you, I now pronounce you, man and wife. Ladies and gentlemen, would you receive, would you welcome for the very first time, the Smith family? And everybody goes, <laughs> You know, and this is the love of your life. You waited. Here you go. And now you're going out and the reception is over with. Now you're coming to the best hotel that Montrose has to offer, the Holiday Inn. I know, just kidding. But you, you've gone somewhere and it's wonderful, right? And you're right about to, and the rapture happens. Are you going to be upset? Of course, all of us that are married will say, absolutely not. You know, been married. You know, been there, done that, right? But that young couple... Do you remember when you say, Jesus, come, but not until two weeks after I'm married? Any of you guys ever have those prayers, right? Some of us did. I don't know. Ezekiel is not a happy camper at this time. So whatever was going on with him or whatever is going on with you, don't worry. The hand of the Lord will be stronger than your anger. Than your anger. Before you know it, our new life would just be great from verse 15 ezekiel was raptured or transported to tel abib where the captives were by the river shebar so look up on your screen here uh, i was able to get an old map for you and we see tel abib do not confuse it with tel aviv today's big city out there uh, down in the bottom right is the persian gulf and you come up uh, the river shebar and on the left side uh, you see tel abib and Babylon. So Babylon took the Jewish people in particular and settled them down in Tel Aviv. Now there's little cities before that. And when we get to some of the minor prophets, they'll tell you about some different cities that were there that the Jews also settled in. But th this is basically where they're at physically when you look um, and you start thinking about where they're at. Now, any ideas why the Lord would do this? Send them there to where the people are and he's going to be there with them seven days. Any guesses? Well, perhaps so that he could sit with the captives. Uh, perhaps so that as he heard them speaking, as he's among them, he would feel their pain, right? Um, and then the burden that they're carrying. Perhaps some of them would be sharing disappointments of what they wanted to do with their lives. And they weren't able to do it because Babylon invaded them. But listen, church. It is simply not enough to preach, to teach, or to proclaim the message of God. We must seek to have a caring heart. The way God feels about people, we need to have that heart. And sometimes it takes us a period of time to be with the people that he wants us to minister to, to get it, to get them, to understand some of their uh, beefs that they have with life so that we can minister them. Note with me the last part of verse 15. And I sat where they sat, and I remained there astonished among them seven days. Astonished among them. Is he astonished because things are so bad? Or is something else astonishing him? Let me, in fact, if you can, would you go to the middle of your Bible to Psalms 137, if you can? Psalms 137. Here is uh, something about, uh, that was written uh, when these guys were in captivity. And so we have a psalm right here. I want to read this to you. It says this. Here's how, so he's sitting with them for seven days, and perhaps this is what he's hearing. Psalms 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept 
when we remembered Zion, and Zion's another word for Jerusalem, so they're remembering the good old days, how it used to be. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it, or by the river, for there those who carried us away captive asked us of asked of us a song, and those who plundered us requested mirth saying, sing us one of those songs of Zion. Now you think they're saying, oh, can you please sing Swing Low, Sweet Cherry Eye? Would, would you please sing a nice song? No, they were making fun of them. You guys worship this God, this one God. Sing to us one of his songs. Give us a little lullaby that he used to sing for you guys. They're making, they're full on making fun of them, right? How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed Happy the one who repays you. This is what they're thinking. Perhaps this is why he's astonished, right? Oh, daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed. Happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Ooh, there is bitterness here. The psalm was written so you get a feel of what's going on. And then we come back here, right? Ezekiel remained astonished for seven days. And he heard, and all he heard was a captive's cry for vengeance. This is what he's hearing. They're there, and all they're talking about is hatred. We're going to get these guys back. It's all about revenge. Church, this is what they should have been doing. They should have been repenting. And they should, have be, see, they should be seeking God's face. But no. They were regretting what happened and praying that one day they may be able to retaliate and defeat the Babylonian captors who made fun of them and taunted them. You guys know what taunt is? In football, a couple of years ago, they made a new rule. And that is that a player cannot taunt another player. So here comes a guy, he catches a pass, and as he's turning to run with him, the guy just floors him. And the guy falls on the floor because he's been floored. And the guy that hit him looks at him, what? That's called taunting. And you get kicked out of the game for that. It's about time they did a rule like that. But I want to take you to Babylon. This is what they were doing to the Jewish captives. They were taunting them. So what are you going to do? Call your God. Call your God. You're here. You work for me. You're going to do as I tell you to do. They were taunting them. That was a bad thing to do. And so instead of saying... Lord, I have sinned against you. We as a people turned our back to you, on you. Jeremiah for 40 years told us to repent, to put away our idols, and we didn't do it. And this is the result of it. They walked away from the heavenly spout of blessing, doing their things, and they wind up in Babylon. They wind up in Babylon. So it's a sad thing. Too many times we... Today are just as guilty. Instead of looking at our circumstances and what happened when we sin against God, we want to get vengeance on people. And we spend our time in thinking and, and, and saying how much we hate them because this happened to us. Because she took my husband. Or because that employer sold the company to someone else and I was the last guy on the totem pole and I got fired. And too many times we're there thinking that instead of, Lord, just have mercy on me. I don't know why this happened, or I do know why this happened, you know, or whatever. Because we don't do that. He's astonished that God's people are looking for vengeance instead of looking to God for mercy. Perhaps it was here in these seven days with the captives that Ezekiel realized God has placed a big job on my shoulders. He's placed a big job on my shoulders. Man, oh, man. This is a serious call to get them to turn to God from where they're right now talking about hatred. So church, it's a good thing for us as Christians to be among his people, to 
weep with those who weep and certainly to rejoice with those who rejoice, for then we can better minister to them. It is good for us to invite one another to dinner so we could get to know each other and we can minister to one another. We share things that are helpful. Declaring the word of the Lord is not, has not ever been easy. However, this is what we as Christian human beings are to do so that we could help turn them from their wicked ways and live with God's blessings upon our lives. We're going to close here for this evening, 15 verses from this chapter. Next week we will prayerfully complete it. But my word, what a job for Ezekiel. And my word, what a job for us. But God does not call us where he doesn't enable us to do the work. And so as these things come up and reveal themselves, ah, it's for us to grow up a little bit. And to believe in the rapture of the church. It's going to happen. It's going to happen in a group. We're out of here. But until that time comes, let's be found faithful serving and declaring the word of God to those he puts in our lives. Father God, we want to thank you for this study tonight as we just covered a few verses in chapter 3 of the book of Ezekiel. But we thank you, Lord, because we learned from it. Thank you, Lord, because you changed maybe the course of our own lives when we're stuck in our own ways. And, Lord, we come to you and we repent of our sin. We ask, Lord, that we might please you and that we might not be so full of ourselves that we can't do the work you've called us to do. So, Lord, help us to leave our old ways and to embrace the challenges and opportunities that you sent our way. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.